It's a huge honor to have a very distinguished speaker this evening speaking at our signature event for the Department of History, the Poly Lecture and the Symposium that we have every year is one of the crown jewels of our department. And it makes us very proud and allows us to do certain kinds of things like inviting very distinguished speakers. It's a very important part of what we do. Um, and this evening, we have the I have the pleasure of kind of setting up the sh handing off, really, uh, the, the microphone to more um, suitable introducers. But I do have the pleasure to say I just bought my copy. <laughs> and I have the first signature that I captured on campus today. Uh, this is probably worth double what it was worth Half. two minutes ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also have the, uh, the pleasure of introducing a fellow classmate. We were at the University of Chicago together. We spent uh, maybe a half a decade in, in combined misery. Uh, we, exist, we lived through the experience, uh, and we came out alive. We weren't... We weren't uh, uh, we weren't, uh, we're still uh, functional yeah, human beings. We were scarred, but we weren't undone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and as you can see, it's produced a groundbreaking uh, piece of scholarship, and it's a great honor to have, to have someone I know from Chicago speaking at this event, an event that I, I hold and cherish very much. Um, the Poly Symposium <laughs> is important to me as a scholar because when I came to the University of Nebraska, the very first year I was here, I was invited to pick out the next year speaker. Um, and it happened to be at the time, uh, Bill Cohen, who came in 2002 and then died two weeks after the, after the speech here. Um, and it was the last big talk he gave in his life, which we don't want any kind of replication. No. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, but it, that experience did teach me one thing. We need to film, the, film these uh, talks. Uh, so tonight we're, we're going to try something new. We're going to film this and then put it on our website. Katrina Jagodinsky had the opportunity to, uh, to interview Professor uh, Resendez today, and, and we're going to also put that on our website as well. So there'll be two elements of this that you'll be able to see. In, if you weren't able to come to, to the talk tonight, you'll be able to see it later. Um, and this is something that the department's going to do routinely now. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Bruce Polly. He's going to say a few words about his father and the origins of this speaker series. And I'll hand it off to Bruce, and then I'll come back and introduce Katrina. Thank you. Thank you. I want to tell you just a little bit of why I gave uh, a donation to the history department for the purpose of, of this lecture series. My father was born in Neelai, Nebraska in 1908 and moved to Lincoln with his parents in 1915. He graduated from Lincoln High School in 1926 and from the University of Nebraska in 1930. And he was president of his senior class in 1930, as well as uh, president of his W. Talon fraternity. His fondest activity was being the drum major for uh, the marching band. He just really loved that. Um, he admitted that he actually majored in activities more than anything else while, <laughs> while he was here, even though technically he was a, a business major, and then went on to join his father at the Pauley Lumber Company on uh, 27th and E Street, which a few of you older folks may uh, Remember, it went out of business in, in 19, the end of 1999. Anyway, uh, although he was a businessman, his real passion was history. Uh, whenever we went on a trip, uh, which was pretty often, uh, he wanted to visit uh, every historical site <laughs> that he possibly could along the way. And uh, he was basically the reason why I became a history major and went on to become a history uh, professor. Uh, without that inspiration, I, uh, I might have gone into some other field. Normally, of course, I would have followed in his footsteps and have joined him at the Pauley Limber Company. But no, history was, was my passion, and I, I'm everlastingly grateful to him that he never insisted 
that I, I entered the lumber business because I would have been frankly bored to tears <laughs> if, I, if I had. When I was married to my wife, Marianna, who was over here in 1963, my mentor said, you will live a very interesting life and that it, it has been. And so I'm grateful to my father for his inspiration. And I felt it important to uh, return something to the people that he loved in Nebraska from what he had earned while working at the Pauley Lumber Company. So I thought it appropriate that I make this donation to the history department. And, uh, we were in total agreement, Lloyd Ambrosius and I, who was chair of the department sitting in the second row, that having a lecture series in honor of my father would, would be a wonderful way to honor my father. And it's been, I think, 20 years now, or close to 20 years, since I made that donation. And it was the best investment that I've ever made. <coughs> I've thoroughly enjoyed it all these years. And I think uh, this is probably the best audience that we've ever had for, for this uh, event. So maybe that shows that it's kind of building up in its uh, outreach. Anyway, I am uh, so grateful that you are here and so grateful to my father that because of him, I would have the resources to make this donation. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Katrina Jagodinsky is an associate professor of history. She's going to introduce our speaker. So I'm going to hand the floor to Katrina. Thank you, James, and thank you, Bruce. And thank you to our speaker, Dr. Resendez. Andres Resendez grew up in Mexico City, where he received his BA in international politics international relations and briefly went into politics. He served as a consultant for historical soap operas or telenovelas. Um, he got his PhD in history at the University of Chicago. He has taught at Yale, the University of Helsinki, and at the University of California Davis, where he is currently history professor and departmental vice chair. He is the author, and the reason he is here tonight is because of his book, The Other Slavery, the uncovered story of Indian enslavement in America, finalist for the 2016 National Book Award and winner of the 2017 Bancroft Prize. His other books include A Land So Strange, The Epic Journey of Cabeza de Vaca, and Changing National Identities at the Frontier, Texas and New Mexico, 1800 to 1850, a book I read a bit more than a decade ago while a graduate student, and it has been a treat to follow his career since then. I should note that all of those books are available outside, and I hope you'll take a look at them on your way out. The Other Slavery is an eye-opening and gut-wrenching history spanning four centuries that clarifies the centrality of Indian enslavement in the Spanish, Mexican, and American efforts to colonize Latin and North America. For those of us already familiar with those overlapping histories, Resendez's work synthesizes the traces of slavery we might have noticed in our research, but did not fully understand in terms of scope and significance. For historians of African American slavery, Resendez offers a parallel narrative of the creative and cruel strategies enslavers used to justify their mastery and subjugation. For readers committed to expanding their knowledge of indigenous history, the book demonstrates how familiar narratives about population decline in the face of epidemic disease and overt dispossession were strategies used to complement Spanish, Mexican, and American enslavement of Indians, a practice that indigenous groups also tried to leverage to their own advantage when they could. Explaining key events in Borderlands history through the lens of the other slavery with such clarity that readers might wonder what took us so long to see it, 
Resendez is a scholar shaping the field, and we are very pleased to host him as part of the Poly Lecture Series. We look forward to a tremendous presentation and a discussion afterward. Please feel free, I have to say, to tweet your feedback to at UNL History and follow our feed for other <coughs> upcoming events on campus. Thank you for coming and thank you for presenting. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. It is a true honor to be here in Lincoln. Um, I really want to thank uh, James and Katrina and Bruce, uh, everyone who made possible uh, my presence here and share what I have been uh, learning in the past uh, seven or eight years of, uh, of really intense work. Um, and uh, I also want to uh, thank you all for carving out some time and, uh, and defying the elements in this day to, uh, to be here. I, uh, when I enter this room, I think that you've got to be kidding that, uh, that this is going to hold this audience, but I am blown away that you uh, all were able to come here. So, uh, so the topic today is, uh, is slavery, and it is a topic that brings to mind bodies of Africans stuffed in the hold of a ship or white apron maids bustling in an antebellum home. Uh, history books and movies like the ones I'm showing you here continuously uh, reinforce the notion that slaves were black Africans imported into the new world. Now, may, we may be aware that in the long sweep of history, peoples other than Africans have been held in bondage, but we seem to uh, be unable to escape our historical myopia. So indeed, my recent book, The Other Slavery, tells about the system of bondage that targeted Native Americans, a system that was every bit as terrible, degrading, and vast as African slavery, and yet uh, most Americans are only dimly aware of it, or none at all. Um, according to my estimates, anywhere between 2.5 and 5 million Native Americans were enslaved throughout the hemispheres in the centuries between Columbus and 1900. And interestingly, in contrast to African slavery, which uh, targeted uh, mostly adult males, uh, the majority of these native slaves were, were actually women and children. So the two slaveries are interesting in that they are like mirror opposites of each other. It was a very big deal, but somehow we have chosen to forget all about this. And to get a sense of just how neglected a topic this is, uh, try this. Get into Amazon and type in African slavery, and you will turn up more than 16,000 books devoted to African slavery. However, if you type in Indian slavery, you will find instead uh, some works about the Indian Ocean and Southeast Asia <laughs> and just a couple of dozen specialized monographs devoted to uh, Native Americans held in bondage. The consequences are plainly uh, uh, plain to see. Whenever the conversation turns to slavery, people typically think of black slaves. Virtually no one ever thinks about Native Americans. It is as if each group could fit into a neat historical box. Africans were the ones enslaved, while Indians either died off or were dispossessed and confined to reservations. Now, I have to start out by emphasizing that Indian slavery was not a European invention. Mayas and Aztecs took captives to use as sacrificial victims. Iroquois people waged campaigns on neighboring groups called quote unquote mourning wars to avenge and replace their dead. In the Pacific Northwest, male Indians offered slaves as dowries to finalize elite marriages. So along with the rest of the world, uh, the rest of the planet, Native Americans enslaved one another for millennia. So the image that I'm showing you here uh, on, the, on the top image, you can see the beautiful fresco at Bonampak, a Maya site, where you can see some Maya lords clearly standing, towering over what are quite evident uh, captives. And below, what I'm showing you here is a, um, a folio of the uh, Codex Mendoza, 
Uh, admittedly, the Codex Mendoza is from the middle of the 16th century, so it's a post-contact uh, document. Um, what you have is two warriors uh, holding two individuals by the hair, and if you look at the Spanish gloss there, you will see that it says cautivo, captive, very clearly, um, and uh, that was so common that it was a pictorial convention to depict a captive by somebody being held by the hair. And so that, and that goes back to pre-contact um, era. So it, it was something that occurred in our, in our hemisphere before contact. But with the arrival of Europeans, these pre-existing practices of bondage originally embedded in very specific cultural contexts like the ones I just mentioned a minute ago, became commercialized, expanded in unexpected ways, and came to resemble the kinds of human trafficking that are recognizable to us today. This transformation began with the earliest European explorers. During his second voyage to America in 1493, Columbus sent dozens of Indians from the Caribbean, and accompanying them, was a candid letter addressed to the Spanish monarchs. And I quote him, just a line, so get, get, you, get you a taste of this. May your highnesses judge whether these Indians ought to be captured, for I believe we could take many of the males every year and an infinite number of women. And may you also believe that one of them would be worth more than three black slaves from Guinea in strength and ingenuity, as you will gather from those I am shipping out now. Thus, Columbus inaugurated the Middle Passage, complete with the overcrowding and high mortality rates that we commonly associate with African slavery, but which in fact can be traced back a few years earlier. Now, eventually all European powers became important participants in the Indian slave trade. The English, the French, the Dutch, the Portuguese, but Spain, by virtue of the enormous and densely populated colonies that it ruled, became the dominant slaving power. Spain was to Indian slavery what Portugal and later England were to African slavery. Ironically, Spain began by forbidding the enslavement of Indians. Yet this categorical prohibition did not stop generations of determined conquistadors and colonists from na taking natives truly on a planetary scale, from the Canary Islands to the Philippines and from the tip of South America all the way to, um, to, to Canada, to what is now Canada. And the fact that this other slavery had to be carried out clandestinely made it even more insidious. This is a tale of good intentions gone badly astray. Now, the Caribbean was the laboratory of conquest, and it was also the first and quite likely the worst native slaving ground in the world. At contact, the Caribbean sustained a large indigenous population. Yet from this high point, a tragic demographic collapse followed. By the 1550s, merely two generations after the arrival of Columbus, the natives so memorably described by the Admiral of the Ocean Sea as quote unquote affectionate and without malice and having very straight legs and no bellies had ceased to exist as a people. As any school child knows, smallpox was a major reason for this devastation. But blaming everything on unintended biological consequences is just too easy and not borne out by the sources. Take, for instance, Hispaniola, the island now shared by Haiti and the Dominican Republic, uh, which you can see right in the middle of the screen. And I can get, get you a, a, a larger image right here. Italian demographer Massimo Livibacci, a few years ago, made the crucial point that the first certain documentation of smallpox in Hispaniola appears only in 1518. 1518. And yet, even though 26 years passed before the first documented cases of smallpox began to appear, the native population on this island found itself on a clear path towards extinction. At contact, Hispaniola may have had a population that we can reasonably estimate at around two or 300,000 inhabitants. 
spread out in some 500 communities. So extreme dispersion, which again uh, makes unlikely the uh, easy explanations of, you know, of epidemics gone, gone wild. By 1508, that figure had fallen to 60,000. By 1514, it stood at merely 26,000, according to a fairly comprehensive census, and no longer guesswork. So these Indians were actually parceled out uh, between different Spanish colonies, so they had a pretty good census about how many they were, where they were, etc. And by 1517, that number had plunged to just 11,000 Native Americans. So in other words, one year before Europeans began reporting smallpox, Hispaniola's Indian population had dwindled to perhaps 5% or less of what it had been in 1492, okay? While it is impossible to rule out completely the possibility of re unreported epidemics, it is obvious that other factors were at work in the early years, and as it turns out, Europeans found the largest deposits of gold on Hispaniola, and they quickly put the local residents to work. So if you look at that map, uh, if you see that road between the top of Hispaniola and down into the valley of Cibao, that's where the gold fields were, uh, were founded. Um, the, the image that I'm showing you here, it's maybe familiar to some of you. It's a beautiful image by Oviedo, one of the chroniclers who also happened to be one of the uh, uh, miners, early, early miners in the Caribbean, so he really knew what he was talking about. And so what that represents is the way in which gold was extracted. Uh, basically, groups of Indians, small groups of Indians, uh, were divided into three different quadrillas, as they were called, so three, three different groups. Uh, one group uh, did some superficial digging, which you can see in your, at the right. Uh, another group carried uh, those, uh, uh, that sand uh, to a nearby uh, stream or river. And a third group, usually women, um, had these uh, large uh, pans called bateas at the time, uh, and they wash away the dirt that was at the top to leave the smallest specks of gold at the bottom. Um, so, um, so this is the way uh, gold was uh, mined in, in Hispaniola. This is a process that went on ceaselessly for 15, 17, 20 hours a day. The number of Indians uh, involved at any one time in these uh, gold fields was not too great. It was 10,000, but they, it was enough to really rapidly uh, consume a lot of the Indian population in the island. By the 1500s, um, I mean 15 uh, teens, the number of Indians of Hispaniola had plunged so drastically that the remaining population was no longer able to provide enough labor for the gold mines, let alone for all the other stuff that they needed to do, like plant food um, and uh, build houses, etc. And so to replenish the dwindling workforce, Europeans' labors fanned out to neighboring islands and thus the demographic cataclysm spread out from Hispaniola to the neighboring um, islands, as you can see here. So this map I constructed on the basis of, um, of uh, contracts awarded by the Spanish authorities to individuals who undertook to go bring Indians from especially useless islands, like the Bahamas were known as the useless islands because there was nothing of value according to the Spanish, only people, to bring the people from the places where they were useless to another place where they could be um, of use. And so you can get a very good sense of how Hispaniola, Jamaica, Puerto Rico um, were the centers, the recipients of these, uh, of these initial wave um, of enslavement. Now, um, when we think of uh, these rushes based on precious uh, metals, um, you know, we may think of gold, and certainly in the United States, we think, of course, of the California gold rush. Um, altogether, California, and let me, uh, let me just say, altogether, California produced some 3.7 million kilograms of gold, and in the process, attracted about 300,000 people from the rest of the world. So it was clearly a major phenomenon. Yet the exploitation of silver 
rather than gold was the preeminent Indian slavery activity of the colonial world. And uh, in order to wrap our minds around what these meant in comparative terms, I came up with this graph. So on the left-hand side you have, on the, or, or on the right-hand side, uh, these little bars that I left unlabeled uh, represent the uh, California gold rush, the amount of gold in kilograms produced. And on the left-hand side, you have the amount of silver in kilograms as well uh, extracted um, during this time. So uh, what we can say, first of all, that in terms of duration, the California gold rush was like a hurricane. So gold production skyrocketed in 1849, but peaked only four years later. For all practical purposes, the California gold rush was over in 20 years. This earlier silver rush that I'm talking about um, actually started in the 1520s. It rose to the 16th century, plateaued in the course of the 17th century, and gained a second wind uh, in the 18th century, to the point where during the second half of the 18th century, uh, northern Mexico, the silver mines of northern Mexico, there was never a single gigantic mine in the same way that there was Potosí in South America, but it was a set of different mines. In many years, they were producing over half of the entire silver production of the world. It was produced in this one uh, region, just to give you a sense. Um, so in other words, uh, what you need to imagine is uh, about 13 California gold rushes strung together in the course of the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries to get a sense of the scope of what I'm talking about. And in terms of geographic uh, scope, uh, again, people sometimes talk about the silver mines of northern Mexico, but in fact, uh, these uh, phenomena started in central and southern Mexico. If you go from Mexico City to Acapulco today, you will run into Tasco and some other sites, which were the mines originally developed by Hernán Cortés himself. And that uh, eventually moved to the western slopes, to the Pacific uh, coast, uh, then prospectors and miners moved into the high plateaus in central Mexico. And this map shows you just the, I mean, it's based on the, on the most comprehensive census of mines of the 16th, 17th, and 18th century that I could find. And it gives you a sense of just the sheer geographic scope of this, um, of this phenomenon. If this fantastic silver boom had occurred in the 19th century, Mexico would have become a worldwide magnet like California. In an era of newspapers, steamboats, and widespread transoceanic travel, there is little doubt that the great Mexican silver mines would have lured immigrants from all quarters of the world. But because this boom predated all of these communications and transportation conveniences, and unfolded at a time when the Spanish monarchy prohibited all foreigners from going to the silver districts, Mexico had to do uh, with its own human resources, especially Native Americans. So California attracted some 300,000 people from the outside, yet colonial Mexico had to satisfy a hugely greater demand for labor with no access to volunteers from the rest of the world. So the Indians who lived around the mines were the first to be pulled into the system, and eventually Indians from farther away uh, had to be brought in. So what I'm showing you here is actually a picture of uh, um, taken by uh, an American miner during the Porfirian era in 1905 to who went to Guanajuato, and it shows um, the, you know, the working conditions, which would not have been radically different from, from what they would have experienced in the 16th or 17th century. That is, uh, big silver mines were different from gold mines in that that required following the silver veins, usually down. So this was not just superficial digging as gold. It required going, following the vein. Uh, it required then bringing that ore up to the surface, and this was done on the back of, uh, of workers like this. Uh, because they used chicken ladders, so to speak, they needed to have their hands free, so they basically dangled uh, the ore on fiber bags that were propped up against their foreheads, as you can see here, so that they could use their hands as they climbed up 
And then that ore had to be crushed to a very fine powder mixed with some toxic reagents, especially mercury, uh, in order that the mercury would amalgamate with the, sister, with the, with the silver, sink down to the bottom, um, and produce um, the silver. So that, again, that process seems very simple enough, but it was a major, a major, a major, a major uh, labor sink. If you can imagine that, especially in the 16th, 17th century, there were no um, explosives available. So just the, the whole hole had to be done by hand without explosives or anything like that. And these included, I mean, some of these mines in Guanajuato, uh, when they were finished in the 16th century, were reputed to be the deepest man-made shafts in the world. Um, so, uh, so that you can get a sense of the scale of this. Now that story uh, illustrates very well what went on in, in Northern Mexico, but these connections also explain a great deal of the historical experience of the American Southwest. For instance, um, in the summer of 1680, the Pueblo Indians of New Mexico rose up and launched the most massive rebellion Spaniards had ever experienced in North America since the early days of conquest. The nervous center of this movement was the Pueblo of Taos in northern New Mexico. So there it is, New Mexico, Arizona, which will be very dear to my friend Bill Beasley here. Uh, Taos is way at the top there. Uh, so that was the center of this movement. And from inside a kiva, or underground chamber, used for ceremonial occasions in Taos, a local shaman named Pope dispatched runners to more than 70 um, Indian communities, some of them as far as the present-day Hopi Rep Reservation in Arizona, some 300 miles away. And mind you, they didn't have horses. They had to go on foot. They basically were long-distance runners. Pope's plan was to get all of these indigenous communities to rise up on the same day to overwhelm the much smaller Spanish population living in this region. And to this end, the, ru the runners carried an extraordinary device, a cord of yucca fiber containing as many knots as there were days before the insurrection. By untying one knot every day, each community would know when to strike. The revolt swept through New Mexico on August 11 and 10, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 10 and 11, 6 of 1680, destroying houses, ranches, and churches, and succeeding mightily. Within two months, all Spanish living in New Mexico were either dead or had been driven out of the country. Writers have emphasized the religious aspects of the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. They have focused on the charismatic Pope and his ability to coordinate so many Pueblos. These authors have also been rightly impressed by the burning and defacing of churches and the torturing and killing of friars during the uprising. So again, explaining the motives of people in remote times from our own is a very difficult um, enterprise. And of course, rebellions are seldom triggered by a single cause. However, in my book, I try to make the case that while religion was certainly a very important factor, the Spanish enslavement of New Mexican Indians played a major role in triggering this massive rebellion. For one thing, rebellious leaders talked about it. One of the demands of the rebels was, and I quote them, so this is one of the very few clear statements that we have about what this movement was all about. It was that all classes of Indians forcibly held by Spaniards be given back to the rebels. Uh, I mean, uh, if you look at the New Mexican society at that time, in the late 17th century, they had servants. Virtually all the households in New Mexico had servants, and many of them were actually Indian servants. One of the rebellion leaders also asked that, quote, his wife and children be given up to him. And the same thing, uh, Apaches participated in this uh, movement, and they also uh, claimed some of their own to be given back. So, uh, so by the statements of their own rebels, we know that slavery uh, was part of the equation, at least. And furthermore, the geography of this uprising is just as suggestive about the importance of the Indian slave trade. Although the uprising is popularly known as the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, the movement actually encompassed 
a large swath of territory, a long slaving corridor leading south from New Mexico to the mining region of Chihuahua and also west to Sonora. So in particular, this large mine in Parral was the destination of many of the goods and many of the peoples coming out of New Mexico. Um, um, and, and the insurrection involved not only Pueblo Indians, but also Apaches, Conchos, Humanos, Salineros, and many other groups. And so what I have done in this map that you are seeing is to overlay what I call the corridors, the, you know, the flow of slaves uh, shown by those arrows, along with the areas of rebellion during the 1680s. And you can see that the match is pretty good. Um, so again, another little bit of evidence that supports the idea that labor coercion was uh, an important part of this insurrection. One of the most fascinating aspects of the phenomenon of Indian slavery is the involvement of the Indians themselves. Native Americans participated in the slaving enterprise since the very beginning of European colonization and before, as, you know, as we started in the talk. However, at first, they played a secondary role to the Europeans, who after all possess the most developed uh, warfare technologies, especially horses and firearms. Indigenous peoples became local suppliers at first, junior partners, guides, guardsmen, intermediaries. But with the passage of time, Native Americans came to acquire horses and weapons of their own. And as they increased their power, they came to control a larger share of the traffic in natives. By the 18th and 19th centuries, they had taken control of much of the business. No other Indian nation attained the spectacular success of the Comanches, uh, which became the preeminent supplier of indigenous slaves, both to other natives as well as to European colonists. And that is not only the Spanish, but the French and the English who were around that enormous area wedged between Texas and New Mexico known as Comancheria, which I'm showing you um, here. Uh, their expansive territory uh, became a major trading center um, as recent works by historians, one of your own, Pekka Hamalainen, Brian DeLay, Joaquin Rivalla Martinez, and others have made very clear. So um, according to one witness, in 1744, Comanche trading parties traveled, and I quote, more than a thousand leagues from New Mexico in the course of a year acquiring captives and returning to offer their loot in the trading fairs in New Mexico. One missionary recorded the enthusiasm caused by the arrival of one of such trading emphasis, em embassies. So here is just one line to give you a flavor of this. Um, here the governor and his lieutenants gathered together as many horses, metal tools, and everything possible as they can for trade and border with these barbarians in exchange for deer and buffalo hides, and what is saddest, in exchange for Indian slaves, men and women, small and large, a great multitude of people. For Comanches themselves, the Indian slave trade was not just a business, but a way, but a way of life. Comanches sold some of their slaves, but they retained a large portion of their captives. One witness noticed that Quote, nearly every family among the Comanches had one or two captives. Many of the captives were women who were actually incorporated into Comanche society as secondary wives. That is, they were, uh, they were sort of the wives of the wives, if this makes uh, some sense. Uh, Comanche men hunted bison, but women were the ones who processed the dead carcasses, uh, preparing the meat and curing the hides an extraordinarily labor-intensive activity. And successful Comanche men could have five, 10, or, or more wives. In addition to women, boys were the other significant contingent of slaves in the Comancheria. Their main occupation was tending the animals. As Comanches grew, strong, grew stronger, they accumulated horses and mules. And managing all of these herds required prodigious amounts of labor that neither the warriors nor the women uh, were able or willing to, to give. And so it was not uncommon for such boy slaves 
to manage herds of 30, 50, 70 uh, horses, a very grueling activity, especially if you think about it in the winter. So for Comanches and other groups like Comanches, slaves constituted a very versatile commodity that could be used as an exploited underclass, as pawns that could be exchanged for kin members captured by other groups, or simply as the most ubiquitous form of currency in the region. Now, um, what about Americans? So we're getting to that. Uh, Indian slavery engulfed the entire continent, but the timing varied depending on the region. By the 19th century, Indian slavery had nearly disappeared in the eastern seaboard. In colonial times, the Carolinas had been a major Indian slaving ground, as several works have made very clear. I'm thinking especially of Alan Galay, for example. New Englanders had impressed rebellious Indians and shipped them to the Caribbean. Again, plenty of uh, scholarship on that. French colonists in Eastern Canada had procured thousands of natives from the Great Lakes region from the interior. Again, very well documented. However, during the 18th and especially in the early 19th century, the traffic of natives was largely replaced and overshadowed by African slavery in this whole region. Yet Indian slavery continued to thrive in the West. The best evidence comes from letters and diaries of westbound Americans. In New Mexico, for example, James S. Calhoun, the first Indian agent of the territory, could not hide his amazement at the sophistication of the Indian slave market. And I quote one line, the value of the captives depends upon age, sex, beauty, and usefulness. Good-looking females not having passed the sear and yellow leaf, that is a Shakespearean reference, by the way, so we had a very literate uh, in Indian agent. Not, so not having passed the sear and yellow leaf are valued from 50 pesos to 150 pesos each. Males, as they may be useful, one half less, never more. Similarly, California may have entered the Union as a free soil state, quote unquote free soil state, but American settlers soon discovered that the, that the buying and selling of Indians was a common practice. As early as 1846, the first American commander of San Francisco acknowledged that, quote, certain persons have been and still are imprisoning and holding to service Indians against their will and warn the general public that the Indian population must not be regarded in the light of slaves. His pleas went unheeded. The first California legislature passed the so-called Indian Act of 1850, which authorized the arrest of quote unquote vagrant natives who could then be quote unquote hired out to the highest bidders. This act also enabled white persons to go before a justice of the peace to obtain Indian children for quote unquote indenture. According to one scholarly estimate, the Indian Act of 1850 may have affected as many as 20,000 California Indians, including some 4,000 children kidnapped from their parents and used primarily as domestic servants and farm laborers. Mormon settlers, and that is finally the map that I'm showing you here, arrived in Utah in the 1840s from upstate New York, as shown there, looking for a promised land only to discover that in that region, Indians and Mexicans had already turned the Great Basin into a big slaving ground. The area was and is like a gigantic moonscape of bleached sands, salt flats, and mountain ranges inhabited by small bands no larger than extended families. Early travelers did not hide their contempt for these quote unquote digger Indians lacking horses and weapons. These vulnerable Paiutes had become easy prey for mounted Indians. And so Brigham Young and his followers by establishing themselves in the area became the most obvious outlet for such captives. Hesitant at first, Mormons required some encouragement. Slavers tortured children with knives and hot irons to call attention to their trade or threatened to kill any child that went unpurchased. 
Brigham Young, Brigham Young's son-in-law, uh, Charles Decker, witnessed the execution of an Indian girl before he acceded to exchange his gun for the other captive. In the end, Mormons became buyers and even found a way to rationalize their participation in this human market. Buy up the Lamanite children, Brigham Young counseled his brethren, and educate them and teach them the gospel so that many generations would not pass before they should become a white and delightsome people. It was the very same logic that Spanish conquistadors had used in the, since the 16th century to justify the acquisition of Indians. So persistent and widespread was Indian slavery that ending it proved nearly impossible. The Spanish crown had prohibited native bondage under all circumstances as early as 1542 in the so-called New Laws, a really new compact between the metropolis and the New World. Yet the traffic continued. To retain mastery over the natives, European owners resorted to a variety of euphemisms and subterfuges that amounted to slavery in all but name. Another attempt at abolition occurred in the early 19th century uh, in Mexico. Um, but uh, when the, you know, Mexico actually proscribed all forms of native bondage and ex extended citizenship rights to all Indians. Uh, who had been born in Mexico, who were in Mexico, yet Indian slavery persisted in Mexico as well. One more opportunity arose immediately after the Civil War. The United States Congress passed the 13th Amendment, and pr which prohibited both slavery and involuntary servitude, as you can read there in the whole, um, in the whole, um, the whole article. And this formulation, opened the possibility of liberation of all Native Americans held in bondage in the West. However, in various rulings in the 1870s and 1880s, the Supreme Court opted for a narrow interpretation of the 13th Amendment that applied primarily to African Americans and generally excluded Native Americans. So as you know, Native Americans were not granted full citizenship rights until the 1920s. Congress also passed an act abolishing the system known as peonage, defined as the voluntary or involuntary service or labor of any person as peons in liquidation of a debt or obligation that exists in various Western states. So this was the main form that these other slavery had taken in the West. Uh, the, you could not leave the place of work if you owed a debt. And in many of these cases, this is throughout northern Mexico and the American Southwest, in some cases, uh, debts uh, would pass on from, from parents to children. So it worked in fairly parallel ways to, to African slavery. Well, Congress passed this Peonage Act of 1867 to combat uh, the, uh, this, this form of trafficking that existed. Uh, but the written word alone was not enough to eliminate uh, these practices. So forms of native bondage continued through the end of the 19th century and some in some remote regions uh, well into the 20th century. So just to finish, uh, today 45.8 million people in 167 countries live in some form of modern day uh, form of enslavement, according to the latest estimate of the Walk Free Foundation. Slavery is forbidden all over the world, yet not a single region of our globe has been spared from this scourge. Slavery continues to thrive because its beneficiaries resort to debts or prison sentences or some other subterfuge to compel people to work under the threat of violence and offering absurdly low or no compensation. With this growing awareness about the present day slavery, what lessons can we derive from this 400 year story, our experience of Native Americans with these other slavery? Uh, it seems to me that the emphasis on the newness um, of, these, uh, of these slavery is somewhat myopic and misguided. 
uh, in, just by contemplating these 400 year uh, experience, um, we can begin to understand just the staying power of these, uh, the mutability and the staying power of these forms of, uh, of, of enslavement, their breathtaking dynamism and, uh, and uh, the tremendous difficulties involved in ending it that we have experienced until today. Thank you very much. Okay. So if you have any comments or questions, I'd be happy to do what I can. Yes. Can you speak a little bit about the treatment of these enslaved Native Americans? And I know it would, there would be some variations. There are, yeah, there, there is a great variation uh, in all of this. So, uh, so, so maybe I should take a step back and say that one of, the, uh, one of the things that I do in this book is to try to gain us, to get us to, to provide a sense of the overall structure. And so by that, I lump together different practices that in my view, and I provide some definition, amounts to slavery in all but name. And so, uh, so the, the treatment it varies widely. So for example, I look at nomadic groups in northern Mexico who were hunted down at uh, uh, planting time or harvest time, were forci forcibly brought into a state where they were forced to work, and then they were released. So, so this is a, a, a very unique form of cyclical enslavement, if you want to uh, talk about that. So that's one, that was one variation, for example. Um, another one would be these, um, these uh, peonage uh, arrangements in which people were prohibited from going out of the work until they paid their, uh, their uh, debt. Uh, because they needed to eat and be clothed, they never uh, or seldom were able to get out of debt. And as I said, in some cases, the, the, the debts were passed on to, uh, so that was another uh, form. Um, so, I mean, I could go on and on and talk about, uh, um, about maybe interestingly enough, uh, thousands of Indians were shipped to Spain, and that is where I found the best the most, uh, the most detailed evidence as to their daily lives in houses because um, eventually these Indians in Spain actually avail themselves of the legal system to sue their masters for their freedom. And so we have these incredible uh, court cases running for hundreds of pages where we know all the details. They, they come forth and they provide their deposition and they bring witnesses, oftentimes other slaves, um, and so we get a, a, a good sense of their, um, of their situation. So as I said, in many cases, these are women and children. They uh, lived in domestic houses. Their life was uh, almost claustrophobic. So they were confined to the house. I mean, this is, I'm talking about Spain in, in this particular case. Um, and they often um, were trained into, uh, into gainful occupations. So some of the cases that I saw, for example, were weavers. They were skilled weavers. And so these slaves, for example, were sometimes passed on to other families, were leased, right? So that's a valuable piece of machinery to other families. They had some privileges because they were so valuable, so they were allowed to marry whomever they wanted and they made accommodations to live in, within, you know, in, to make family life within the household where they worked. Uh, so again, um, you need to, the uh, record is full of surprises as to what you will find in terms of the actual day-to-day uh, -day, uh, experience of these, uh, of these Indian slaves. Can you say whether there was much brutality though? The way we think of Again, the, the record shows the whole yeah. gamut from extremely cruel, uh, extremely, I mean, terrible. I mean, I have, anyways, I won't go. I'm, I'm a squeamish guy, so I won't go into the worst. Uh, uh, but I have found really terrible all the way to fairly, fairly reasonable treatment um, of these. Yep. Yes. Andres, the information that you're providing is, has been known for 500 years in various ways. Mm -hmm. What was the trigger that made you take a look at this and provide what you've just done for all of us today that other people ignored? 
or didn't see? Well, I think the I think the to me the the catalyst for the book was the growing. Uh, I mean, it started simply as I want to count them. I want to know because numbers have such a power on us, right? And so when we talk about African slavery, immediately you know that we're talking about 12.5 million human beings. And so whether we're talking about Brazil or Cuba or you know the, the American South, whatever, we're talking about a, a combined history with such power. And for when I started the project, there was not a single estimate for uh, for Native American um, number of slaves. So so what really st the the project started with I want to know what's the number. And when you get into the number, then very quickly you run into, so who should be counted as slaves? Because as you know, during the first 50 years, it was possible to make slavery legal, Indian slaves legally. But eventually the Spanish crown clamped down on that. And so I looked at that process very closely and I realized that, well, by then those, uh, those owners were totally dependent on, on Indian slave labor, and so they found ways to get around the law. So I became persuaded that I could then say, okay, so it stops here, but that would be a very incomplete accounting of that number. So in order to really come to a better estimate, I needed to then start exploring these mutations, so to speak, that became so resilient through the centuries. And so I made a catalog of you know the different forms uh, that these took, and so I think that, that so I think the catalyst was this growing realization that for a long time we have uh, take the colonial terminology at face value, right? So when the Spanish crown says, well, but you know the encomenderos were not slavers, or repartimiento was not slaver, or you know that peonage was not slavery. And I started to say, well, no. It, I mean, if you will look at the, uh, the cases on the ground, then uh, you come to a different conclusion. And so that, I think that is the reason why you are right. The information is there. Uh, it is very scattered. It's very difficult to understand the whole scope. So that's what I eventually came to realize. That's what I needed to do. So is that your approach with your graduate students? Look at this information. Think about it and ask questions. Yeah, totally. Same material. <laughs> totally. That no, that has okay. that has worked time and again, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <All> right. <laughs> yes. Thank you for your paper, Andres, and um, for the presentation. I have a, um, a question about kind of status and thinking about African the enslavement of Africans and African Americans, and particularly when we teach it, talking about um, the fact that it's inheritable and that, you know, these laws that start with the status of the child and follow the status of the mother. And I'm just wondering, like, during that brief time when it was legal in the Spanish, um, in the Spanish territories, what was the law? And then also after that, um, were there cases where we see generational slavery or inheritable slavery mm -hmm. or lifetime slavery in the same way when we talk about the slavery of African and African Americans? Yeah. Right. Well, that's a very that's an excellent question. So um, I uh, I said that the f first 50 years slavery was legal, but I I kind of which is true, but it is a little more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it was frowned upon. It had been frowned upon even I mean anyways, but we won't go into the you know medieval history, but it was frowned upon since the almost the beginning. Uh, so since 1500, for example, we find 1500, so nine, eight years after Columbus, uh, some Indians are being shipped back to the New World because they should not have been made as slaves. The Crown eventually, however, realized that it needed uh, Indian slave labor in order to attract colonies to the New World, and so the solution was to make Indian slavery illegal except in a couple of cases. So if in the Indians were cannibalistic, that being a really terrible thing, then it was legal to hold those, those, those Indians in, uh, in bondage. If uh, those Indians had already been made as, as slaves by other Indians, it was okay for you to go and purchase them and keep them as your slaves. The thinking there was that it was much better for these slaves to be under a Christian overlord than under a pa pagan overlord. Um, and uh, finally, Indians who were 
taken in just wars could be legally. Um, and so, so when I say it was allowed, uh, it was really not allowed. It was, but, but these loopholes were big enough so that it led to the decimation of the Caribbean, as I said. Uh, so this is the period of the decimation of the Caribbean. Um, so, um, so really, uh, the point that I'm trying with this convoluted story is that uh, Indian slavery was very different from African slavery it, in, in, what, in that it was very dependent on case by case. Uh, it was generally, even if, even as a, in the course, the span of a lifetime, you could change your condition from a slave to become a fairly, you know, uh, to, uh, to find a servile condition that was better than a slave. Um, and uh, we don't know, I mean, I have found, as I said, cases in which the children also became uh, enslaved. And as I said, debts were passed down. Uh, but generally, we have very little evidence for that because the fertility rates of these Indian women were so low. So, uh, so, so really, uh, uh, that condition that you're talking about of passing down from one generation to the next was not as relevant to this uh, slavery. This slavery was different in that you could actually do something about it, even in your lifetime. It was not a perpetual, it was a case by case. And that really defines the approach the, of the Spanish crown to these other slavery. Thank yeah, thank you. Yes? Is some of the reasons that you just described why my, uh, slavery might not have been identified as slavery uh, or documented as slavery because it was under loose terms? And I'm, I'm always curious when, when I hear about Indians they're often referred to having captives. Yeah. Or even Sacagawea, you know, was in a sense a slave. So yep. why, yep. is that part of the reason why it wasn't as, as well documented? It, it just wasn't as legally defined or as specific? Completely. I mean, so uh, it really requires uh, detectives' work because while African slavery um, was legal, it can be found easily in wills and bills of sale uh, because they had to be, to, to cross an ocean, they were counted along the way and you have the port records that give you a very good sense of their number and where they're coming from and who they were, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, we're talking about um, a source of slaves that was, uh, that, that was procured and consumed in the same continent and, so, and that was illegal. So the, so the, the record uh, situation is very m much more complicated. I mean, literally, you didn't really want to write about this because it was illegal. Um, however, there is uh, uh, a continuous paper trail spanning all of these, you know, all of these uh, provinces in the New World from the 16th century all the way to the 19th century. And even though sometimes the allusions are fairly vague, in other cases we have investigations. We have unlikely uh, discoveries. Uh, for example, the fact that, uh, as, as we were saying in the morning, the fact that Indian slavery was illegal made it also a political football. If you had a, a rival, a political rival, you could, you could accuse that rival of uh, illegally enslaving Indians. And everybody who was somebody had Indian slaves. So everybody was, uh, everybody, nearly everybody could be liable to such, a, such an accusation. Um, so in those, sometimes investigations were made and then you get a, a better sense of, of that phenomenon. So, uh, so the record is a little more idiosyncratic, a little spottier, um, but there is documentation to, uh, there's enough documentation for this. And as I said, um, I also, in closing, so my estimate of 2.5 to 5 million is uh, the best I can do, uh, but it is, I admit that it is very, that it is speculative and that I invite other people to do, come up with better uh, estimates. I could spend the rest of my life trying to estimate the slaves for all of these different regions in the new world in 50 year intervals as I do. Um, and I think people are doing it, so, but we need to have a baseline um, to, to start a conversation in a more meaningful way. Yeah, so one here and then over there, yes. Have you focused only on Spanish enslavement, or can you compare what the Spanish did with what the uh, Portuguese or Dutch or French or English did in terms of enslaving Native Americans? 
Yeah, well, I mean, in my book, I mostly focus on the Spanish, Mexican, and then Americans in the Southwest. So it's a very, uh, it's a moving story from the Caribbean to Mexico to the American Southwest. But, but your numbers are for- For the entire- areas. No, it's for the, my numbers are for the entire hemisphere from Columbus to 1900, okay. of all nationalities. Uh, there are many scholars working on, say, the English, so I mentioned Alan Galay, for example, who comes with a startling, uh, uh, startling number that in the, you know, from, I believe it's 1780, I mean, 1680 to 1720, in that 40 year period, uh, more Indians were shipped out of Charleston into the Caribbean than Africans were imported into the Carolinas, just to give you a sense of, uh, of the scales. So, so there are other scholars um, taking other parts, other pieces of this, uh, of these great phenomenon. And of course, the whole field is ripe for comparisons because not everybody did it the same way, right? So, uh, so yes, there was a, yes. By another, a different ethnicity, you mean non-Indians? Is that? Uh, I'm also referring to Mexicans. Oh yeah. We, oh, uh, so the Native Americans, so people like Comanches, Utes, etc., uh, enslaved um, other Indians primarily. Uh, so and again, uh, I really rely on the work of Joaquin Rivaya Martinez, who has actually developed a very extensive database, you know, like case by case. Uh, in many cases, they, they are Indians. Uh, the second most prominent were Mexicans. Um, and again, that is a very complicated after 1821 when Mexico becomes independent from Spain because Mexico abolished all uh, caste references to race, right? So everybody's a Mexican citizen. So we don't know exactly who these people are, but they are Mexicans. Um, and of course they have some white people, white uh, women for example, and entire books that, would, that became almost like a literary genre of the captive, the, capti the captivity narrative of white people held by Comanches or other uh, groups. So they indeed took uh, people from other races in the way that you're defining them. There is plenty of, of records about that. Yeah. I, I was just gonna say, Andres, this is so interesting because what you're doing, Hollywood in many ways preceded what you were doing with Comancheros, yeah. um, The Searchers, yeah. all kinds of great movies yeah. that took place that oh. took up exactly that what you're topic. Talking about. Absolutely. And so we have to pay more attention to Hollywood. <laughs> what you're saying? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, when you get into the nitty gritty of that, uh, it is very interesting because the uh, Comancheros, these are uh, traders, uh, especially New Mexican traders, who did specialized in trading with the Indians, and they also uh, acted as intermediaries in cases when, when people were kidnapped. And so what's very clear is that white families who had the means and the money often engaged these Comancheros to ransom their family members, whereas Mexicans, or other Indians did not have the resources, could not pay the ransoms, and so these other people oftentimes stayed with the with the Indian groups uh, for longer periods. Yes. Uh, you, you you ticked off uh, the countries that were most closely associated with slavery: England and, and the Dutch and the Portuguese and the Spanish. You said nothing about Germany. Okay. Of course, Germany wasn't even a country until 1871, but now. I'm not an American history specialist, but isn't it true that Germans in the United States, German Americans by and large, were not pro-slavery even in the South and mm -hmm. were abolitionists in the North? Yeah. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure that this is true, but I yeah. think it's true. And did, if that is true, did this have anything to do with the fact that Germany was split and, and there was kind of no state approval of, of uh, slavery or, or was there something in the religion of the Germans that made them uh, oppose slavery? 
That's a great question for which I have no answer. <laughs> I, I don't know uh, to what extent German colonists in the Midwest uh, enslaved or did not enslave Native Americans. Maybe somebody out here would know, but I don't really know. I was going to say in the Carolinas, some of the Moravians did. I mean, they were split. There were people who were old slaves that were Moravian psychiatrists, and some who were not. And then, of course, the 48ers came over, and most of them tended to be abolitionists, but they were, there were, the German speaking communities in the South were conflicted over whether or not they should be um, engaged in slave holding. And in the 1700s, the Moravians were split as well. They owned slaves. Some of them did, yeah. Okay, this is African slaves, yeah. Okay. Yes? Uh, I know the Spanish in particular were interested in converting the slaves uh, to, uh, to their religion. Uh, how much of a role did the idea of whether these other people had souls or not played into this? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, the whole discussion about whether Native Americans had a soul had everything to do with whether they were enslavable or not, right? Uh, if they did not have a soul, then they could be rightfully enslaved. And if they did, then they would have to be painstakingly persuaded rather than enslaved. There was no ultimate verdict as to who won in that famous debate uh, in 1550-51 between Las Casas and Sepulveda, right? Even though everybody kind of assumes that Las Casas won. I mean, it's sort of, you know, it, it sort of petered out. And, and similar questions cropped up later on in the 16th century and the 17th century. Um, I would say that the church did play a role first in the definition of, uh, in the shaping of slavery, and I'm talking about the 14th and 15th centuries, and then in the movement to abolish uh, the enslavement of Indians. So in 1537, the Vatican actually issued a very strongly worded document um, um, urging for the uh, liberation of all Indian slaves in the New World. Um, and this is something I, um, in the book, I go into these remarkable abolitionist campaign that the Spanish crown undertook in the final decades of the 17th century. And they used this precedent by the church in order to, to try to bolster the case for the liberation of Indians. So the church did play a very significant role, both in favor and against uh, this, um, this slavery. All right. Well, thank you all so much for your great questions and for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Should I turn this off? Uh, I want to say one word. Uh, uh, I really want to thank our speaker. It's fantastic. I also want to thank Katrina Jaganinsky for arranging this. She spent the whole year planning for this event. Spectacular turnout. So mm -hmm. thank you, Katrina. Thank you. Andreas is going to be outside signing books. Thank you. Thank you. So I will return this to you. Thank you. It's on. It's great. Yeah.